Welcome to your intended message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who can help you communicate more effectively, whether that's one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many, and perhaps the most important conversation, one-to-self. I'm your host, George Tora. My guest today is Jeff Savilico. Hello, hello. Here's three facts you should know about Jeff. There he is. Number one, he's, uh, he's full of energy. You don't even have to tell you that. You can see that. Uh, he's, number one, he's produced and starred in his own award-winning headline clean comedy show with Caesars Entertainment on the Las Vegas Strip for the past 10 years. That's quite a record. Number two, he's the founder and chairman of Win Win Entertainment. That's a 501c3 national nonprofit that brings smiles to kids who are in hospitals and foster homes. And how does he do that? By arranging visits from professional entertainers, athletes, and celebrities. And number three, he's never had a real job. The only way he's ever made money is by doing shows. And that started when he was 10 years old, when he would do shows at local tot lots for $25. Wow, $25 sounds like a lot of money for a 10 year old. Jeff Savilico, <laughs> welcome to your intended message. Uh, thanks so much, George, it is great to be here. Uh, and, and Jeff, I just thought I'd add, when, when we talk about what you're doing with Win Win Entertainment and you arrange for these visits, we're not talking about half a dozen visits here, are we? What are we talking in terms of the numbers of, of visits athletes, celebrities are making to children? Yeah, so we're now up to 25 programs nationwide. So before coronavirus, all of our visits were in person. So we'd have performers, athletes in various cities or who were traveling to various cities. But now, of course, uh, post coronavirus, when everyone's virtual, we pivoted all of our programs online to be virtual. And that's actually been a really good thing for us in terms of impact and reach and accessibility, because now any hospital nationwide can sign up for our programs and any performer, anyone can get involved from anywhere uh, as long as they were connected to the internet. So we have people in, in smaller cities, in Columbus, Ohio, Tallahassee, Florida, you know, wherever, uh, zooming in or over WebEx or any of the other platforms to perform for kids in hospitals uh, it, all over the country. It's really pretty incredible. Now, I'm curious, uh, th that is a wonderful, a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful project to do because uh, these children in hospital, I mean, it's, it's terrible to be in a hospital at any time, uh, mm -hmm. especially when you're a child. Right. What, what motivated you to start this program? So uh, the first show I ever did uh, publicly as a kid was a charity show. It was actually a show for a special needs school outside Philadelphia. So you mentioned, you know, I used to do these shows. Um, you know, most of way, way back in the day, you know, seven, eight years old, nine years old, I started doing little shows in my kitchen just uh, for my grandparents and, and my grandmother. But uh, then I started doing when I, when I started saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a performer. I would go to these uh, children's hospitals and go to this special needs home. I, I did a whole bunch of shows in, in high school. I formed a juggling club in high school. We used to do shows uh, for senior care facilities and uh, all, all sorts of outreach programs. So I really I really owe the the charity performing to how I, I got involved in, in all of this and how I really uh, fell in love with performing. So, uh, you know, a lot of performers, they will uh, reach a certain point in their career and then say, okay, I'm going to start doing some charity work. For me, it was kind of the opposite. I started doing charity work. I started doing charity shows and that's really how I cut my chops and uh, I never stopped. I always wanted to, to honor that part of how I got involved in the business. And so for a while, I was just making a commitment to do one charity show a month. That was just something that I like to do personally for me. I felt like that, that, was my, that was my way of volunteering, my piece of philanthropy. And all through high school and college and after college, that's what I did. And I uh, got to Las Vegas and the, the performer community here 
it was huge uh, and very, very giving. And uh, now I had access to all these performers, all these performers who were my friends, my peers, my colleagues. And I started doing these charity shows. And by that point, social media was, you know, in full, full swing. And I would post pictures of these really moving moments in uh, hospitals and pe performers would say, Hey, I want to do that. I want to get involved with that. How do I sign up and how do I get involved? And so it really happened very organically. We just, uh, uh, just kind of rolled it into an organization. I, I, I felt like a, almost a charity agent. I was, I was connecting all of these performers with all these hospitals and different programs, but uh, obviously there was no money exchanged. It was purely just arranging time and talent. And at a certain point I realized, okay, I have a stable of performers who are doing all these charity shows and I have a, a roster of hospitals and foster homes and uh, other organizations that wanted talent. And so I was in the middle matching them up. So it really, really happened organically. And it's at 10 years now. It's, it's been 10 years now. So it's, it's pretty incredible. We started with just a couple of local hospital shows here in Vegas. And now, as I said, 25 programs nationwide, uh, everywhere from you know, Reno and, and Phoenix uh, on the West Coast to, to New York and Orlando and on the East Coast. Now, the wonderful thing when, when you do that for children, um, my thinking is that children will remember that. And mm -hmm. it's more likely that they will pay back in, in the future. They, they were more likely to get involved in charity because of what it meant to them. And maybe the odd one might say, I'm going to learn to juggle like Jeff Savillico. <laughs> <laughs> that poor kid, that poor kid. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. And so we actually started kind of just helping and serving everyone. It was the, the win-win entertainment was a, at a very lofty and just uh, it, not a very focused vision. And that's purely because I didn't come from the nonprofit world. I was an entertainer. I was like, oh, let's help everybody. And then I learned as time goes on to actually really help uh, people. You, really, you need to narrow your focus and you need to kind of pick, this is what we do. This is who we are. And once you do that, it'll actually be a deeper impact and a longer, more, more lasting reach. And so that's what we did. So, so we narrowed, we used to do senior care facilities and uh, shows for the USO. And but there's all sorts of organizations that, that do that already. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to focus on uh, children's hospitals and foster homes because the performers really love doing that. Uh, they, there's just something about doing a show for, for, for kids. Even if a lot of the performers I, I work with, we're, we do shows for companies, we do corporate events. Uh, this is able to tap into a different side, a, a more innocent side and become a more playful. They can be a little sillier, a little goofier than they would if they're doing a corporate event or a motivational speech perhaps. And so yeah, the, the, doing it for the, for the kids is just, uh, it's how can you say no? You know, like when you ask a performer, hey, would you, you, know, would you mind Skyping in or Zooming in to this children's hospital? I, I have yet to meet a performer that doesn't drop everything and say, oh my gosh, I would love to. They might say, oh, I can't do this one. I'm booked. But you know, what about next week? And fortunately, we have so many programs going. There's always, there's always a need. Um, there's always a, a time and a place that we can arrange uh, a visit based on availability. Jeff, in your role as a, a performer and entertainer um, from, from the age of 10, one of the, one of the, I'm guessing, one of the important ways you need to communicate was not only to the people around you, but also to yourself. How does, how does a 10 year old, or how does you, how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep yourself focused? Because I imagine if you were doing all this entertaining uh, while you're growing up, there must have been people around you saying, that guy's not normal, he's weird. <laughs> Well, George, I got news for you. They still say that. Uh, now I'm 37, and and uh, they they say things like, "Are you gonna? How are you gonna do this? Uh, you gonna know, get a I real say, job?" <laughs> exactly. I say, "Well, you know what? It's going pretty well. I, I love doing it. Um, it's very fulfilling. Uh, make great money doing it. So I, I don't really see a, a reason to stop. Um, you know, and I, I actually, it's funny you say that. Even even graduate from college." I always thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to perform until I am not enjoying it. And, and I knew that a part of that, of course, was be able to, to thrive financially. So if at a certain point, uh, I'm, I'm, that kind of overwhelms me. And I think, you know what, this isn't fun anymore because people always talk about the difference between doing something as a hobby and then when you make, you make it your profession and you have to pay the bills and, and think about your future and sustainability and, and everything. 
there, there's a lot more there going on. So I always said, if at any point I'm, I'm not enjoying this and I'm not succeeding, I'm not doing well financially, et cetera, say then I'll do something else. But until then, I'm going to just run with this and, and give it a shot. And I, it's been 16 years since college and I don't, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. So um, they, yeah, I definitely, some people think I'm weird, but uh, I, I honestly, I like that. I think, I think performers embrace that. I think, I think they kind of tend to think about all the people who say, oh, I wish I could do that. Um, you know, but X, Y, Z. And in reality they could, um, it's just a question of their time, their priorities uh, and everything else. And so, so I really kind of, I, I relish in that sense of feeling almost like a rebel a little bit. Like I'm, I'm bucking the system. I'm able to, I'm able to make money and to support myself by, by, per, by performing and traveling and, and doing shows. So I, I love it. Mm. Jeff, as a performer, what are, what are some of the maybe weird conversations that you have with yourself as you're preparing to get on stage? Oh yeah. I talk to yourself is so important. I talk to myself all day long. Uh, and I, and that sound, that might sound odd, but I, I always have a running dialogue in, in, in my head going. I think, I think that's really, really important. And I think as a performer, you, you have to almost have this alter ego sense to be able to jump up in front of 10, 200 to 20,000 people, whatever it is, because at a, at a certain a certain level, you're kind of becoming a superhero for the, for the session, for the day, for whatever it is. You got to step up. Uh, there's a lot of pressure there, and so I, I found that that you know some people visualize, uh, so some people uh, you know, talk to themselves in affirmations and really kind of charge themselves up. I, I find that I'm constantly saying to myself, you know, Jeff, you got this. You can do this. You know, yes. Even just the the word yes. When you think about the word yes, it just creates this positive kind of glow. And I, I find, find myself when I'm doing some of my more difficult juggling tricks or stunts, at a certain point, you've done them so many times, your body's on autopilot, you're, you're in the space, you're, you're kind of just in, in your zone. And I just want to fill my mind with positive thoughts during that time. I don't want to, anything to creep in to then become a self-fulfilling prophecy like, oh, you know, you haven't practiced enough or uh, this is a really big client or somebody's in the audience watching. When you start going down that path, then again, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you doubt yourself and then you don't do everything full out and, and you're just a little off. And so uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of talking to myself um, constantly. I remember he, hearing somewhere and said, you know, if, if Mo, if you allowed anybody else to talk to yourself the same way that most people talk to themselves, you would never stand for it. You would never, you know, you would never let somebody else say like, oh, you're no good. You're worthless. You know, you're going to mess up like you always do. You'd, you'd say, hey, man, what's, you know, what's, what's your problem, right? You'd be picking a fight. Yet so oftentimes that's how we talk to ourselves. And I, I've, I've made that decision that I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to always assume the best and I'm going to be happy and positive and just put that good energy out into the world and, and it will come back. Um, there's a certain t thing too. I mean, things go wrong at events, right? There's technical issues. Uh, things happen, right? I mean, I, I mess up. You, you forget something, you blank, you, Oh, I should have done this or, um, and if you come at it from, from a positive approach with, with that good attitude and you're, you're talking yourself up, then you can handle it, right? No, when, no matter what happens, right? You're, you're, you allow yourself to be authentic and be vulnerable. The audience can tell that, they can sense that, and they can say, hey, sure, like, yeah, something he messed up, but we all mess up. And if you acknowledge it, it with that positive kind of attitude and that voice, um, you're, you're better. I think you're better off, personally. Mm. Jeff, as you have matured as you've grown as a as a performer you started as a as a juggler and the type of entertainment that you did has changed over time how how has it changed and how has your self talk or self expression mm. changed at the same time because of that or maybe to drive that yeah that's a that's a great question i i think it's about shifting uh, like kind of shifting the focus. So, so yes, I started off as a, as a juggler and, and people always kind of want to put you in a box, right? Especially as you're an entertainer. And it's like, hey, we need two magicians, two jugglers, a still walker and, and a face painter or something, right? So they, they, they want you to fit in those categories. But at the end of the day, 
that's just the medium by which you connect with an audience and you connect with people in an individual level and uh, an audience at large. Right. So sure. When you're a kid, it's all about the juggling, right? I was trying to, Hey, I learned three balls and I learned four balls I learned five balls. And you learn these tricks with all of them. I want to juggle the pins and the rings and you know, you buy flaming torches and that's really cool. And you, you know, you're a teenager, you're juggling fire. So you feel kind of uh, like a rebel and uh, you know, juggle knives and bowling balls and all these things that the audience, you know, you think the audience wants to see. And then at a certain point in your career, when you're showing your juggling to people, you realize uh, very quickly and oftentimes very harshly that uh, nobody really cares about the juggling per se, the tricks, the stunts. They care about being entertained. They care about the engagement experience. They care about laughing, about being moved, about learning about the performer. All right, how did he learn these tricks? Was there a mentor? Does it, does it run in the family? Uh, you know, does it, um, how, how has he, how has he grown as a performer? Where, what kind of shows, you know, what's the craziest thing that's happened to him on stage, right? They, they kind of think about all these uh, other things as, as they're seeing you perform. And, and again, it's not about the actual uh, juggling in this case. And I think that's a really appropriate metaphor for life, right? It's, it's never about the thing that you do. It's about how that thing resonates with people, how that thing moves people, the story behind that thing. Um, you know, you can take any, any company that has a great story, um, or maybe it's, uh, environmentally sustainable or, right. It's about, nobody cares about this soap versus that soap. They care that it was made, created locally and they, they care about the story behind it. And now more so than ever, that's, that's the case. So I think as you, as I've matured as a performer, I have gone from juggling to entertaining, uh, to really connecting with people and trying to take them on a journey. Um, to, trying to make them feel better when they walk out of the room than when they did when they walked into the room, for example. And that's a, a perfect tie-in with my nonprofit as well, Win-Win Entertainment. We're connecting people who need something, kids in hospitals, with people who want to do something, which is entertainers who want to give back. So I think it's a natural progression of life, right? You, you kind of think about a little more about giving back and, and connecting and moving people and, and legacy and, you know, what, what, where is it all going? Those bigger existential uh, questions. And uh, for me, I think it's just really easy to see now as a kid, okay, it was juggling, juggle, juggle, juggle. Then it was entertaining. Now it's connecting with people. And, and that really informs the type of events that I take on and how I want to spend my, my days. Let's expand that concept of connecting with people. What does that mean to you and how do you go about that? Well, especially today, given everything that's going on, I think when you bring an authenticity to an event and a vulnerability, I feel like everyone can kind of relax, take a deep breath and have a better experience. And uh, I, I try to do that, right? It's difficult to entertain across a screen, but I try to just call it out, right? I call, I, I make fun of myself for it. I, I say things like, hey, you know, I, I'm used to dealing with, you know, rolling laughter and hearing, you know, ton, thunderous applause. And now I get a thumbs up emoji. <laughs> you know, and maybe if I'm really killing it, I get an LOL in the chat, right? It's just not the same, right? Then I acknowledge that. So then the attendees feel, okay, you know, there's weird, there's weird, weirdness in our life with this virtual event. There's weirdness for him too, as an entertainer and, and you bring them in. Um, and, and there's, again, there's a connection there. There's a shared experience. Uh, and, and if I talk about, hey, hey, again, nothing related to juggling, right? But if I talk about how much we're all juggling these days in our lives, right? Working from home, social distancing, we've got kids at home, trying, you're, now you're a, a teacher as well as a parent and, you know, the, the phone's ringing and somebody's at the door and you're on a business Zoom and, and you can hear the kids, you know, the baby's crying, like that's real life. And that's what people are dealing with. Um, as opposed to just, hey, watch me juggle seven balls. Um, no, pfft, nobody really cares about that, right? Um, especially since the internet came, right? And then with YouTube, like you can see, you can see anything on YouTube. So what's the difference between just watching videos of impressive feats or juggling or, or whatever? Uh, and and this this experience, it's that live engagement, interactive, the story behind, the narrative, the whole the whole experience. Mm. In your 
Vegas experience in your Vegas show. Ten years, um, ten years, ten year run in Vegas is quite a quite a quite a, a show. And, and I can't think how long Celine, Celine Dion was there. If her show was as long as yours or not, yeah. or, or, uh, or yeah. came in and sat in your audience. But tell us, <laughs> what was that experience like? And and it must have been a challenge to do that. First of all, to get the gig and two, to keep it running successfully and profitably for 10 years. How do you make that happen? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it is challenging. Uh, it was very challenging. It was uh, not what people think. So uh, most people think, okay, you know, Hey, Hey, you get your show and you're getting paid by the company, the, the gaming company to do your show X times a week. Uh, that's really not how it works. Um, so I, I was doing something called four walling is this the term, which is where the, you, you rent the space, right? So you get the four walls of the room. That's pretty much that. That's the idea is like, that's what you get. And then everything else is up to you. So what that means is all of the marketing, all of the production, all of the aspects, all the labor, that's all on my payroll. So I, I pay to rent the space. And then I pay for everything I mentioned, production, every aspect of the show from merchandise to, you know, the smoke machine broke. We need to buy more haze, haze fluid or whatever, right? The spotlight broke. Um, and then all the ticket sales come in and that's what you get. So, you know, it's very volatile. Uh, it can be up and down. There can be great days, um, great weeks. It's a lot like the restaurant business, to be honest. You know, you have a, you have a killer you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday comes and, you know, right. The, the demand is not there. Uh, but you still got to pay your rent. You still got to pay your crew. You, I'm still running marketing. I'm still running. I've got billboards and ads and everything else. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of um, eye opening, right. It, it, uh, it just, I look at things very differently now, right. When you say like, yeah, people used to say like, Oh man, you got a board billboard. Like you really made it. It's like, yeah, I paid for a billboard. Like you could pay for a billboard too. Like, you know, nobody says like, I'm giving you the billboard company doesn't say like, you're successful enough that I'm putting you on my billboard, like it's business, right? And so there's even things like that, where I walk into a show and I think, okay, I walk into a theater and I say, okay, there's, you know, 20% of the room is filled here, like they're probably losing, you know, three to $5,000 tonight, right? I, I think that way now, because I'm thinking, okay, what's the overhead? How big is the cast? What's the crew? How big is the room? What's the rent? Um, and so everything is interconnected. So in that sense, it was a ton of work, but talk about communication. I, I had to communicate well with everyone, right? I, I mean, so many different people, all the different ticket brokers that distribute your tickets. So let's say I book an event and I have to take my show dark. I have to go off for a night. If I don't make sure everyone knows that, and I'm in Orlando doing a corporate event and people show up that they buy bought tickets for that's a major problem and that means that that ticket broker is not going to continue to sell my tickets because they had a bad experience because those customers went back to that ticket broker and said hey hey man what gives you know I bought tickets to a show there well, there was no show tonight so all of the communication with all the ticket brokers and dis distributors let alone the box offices at all of the properties on the strip let alone your crew, right? So, I mean, again, this is real life. Something happens. Oh, my, my, my stage hand, his wife, you know, uh, has an emergency and he can't come in to end the shows in an hour, right? It's like, what, what do you do? How does that person, how have you set up the communication? How have you set up it? Does that person feel comfortable uh, communicating that to me? Does that person feel responsible and is going to find someone else to replace him for the night? Um, so, I mean, I had a company manager, I had, um, you know, a, a sound person, a lighting person, a, a backstage person. I had merchandise people. I had promotional people that would ha be handing out flyers and trying to bring people to show all those people I had to communicate with, uh, because they're really a, a team. And, uh, that's, that was probably the biggest challenge was learning how to communicate effectively with so many shows and, and so much room for error. Right. Because the comedy show in and of itself is, is, is full of rooms for error. That's what makes it fun. So you bring people up on stage. I'm communicating with them in the moment. And sometimes people can be difficult. So, right. Sometimes they can be great. Sometimes they can be difficult. Depends on uh, a lot of things. Right. If you bring a kid up on stage, 
you know, who knows what they're going to say or do, right? That's kind of part of the fun, but they could, they could start showing you dance moves that they learned for, for TikTok right in the middle of your bit. Um, so I, I think, you know, as far as, as the intended message, I, lo I love the name of, of your podcast because there, there was a really, um, it was really challenging to, to kind of craft and deliver my intended message to all these different parties and to be constantly in communication uh, and make sure everything was, was going smoothly and that everyone felt comfortable communicating with, with me uh, in, in the right way. Jeff, you, you said it's not about the juggling. It's mm -hmm. not about the, the, maybe even the comedy. So what, what was your intended message that you wanted the audience to take away from your shows? Yeah, I would say it all comes down to I want them to feel better when they walk out than they do when they walk in. Uh, so it's an escape, right? I want, I want better about themselves or better about the world. You, you know what? That's a great point. Both, both, because I, I want to be able to create a space where people can laugh and experience a completely unique, spontaneous event that will not ever be recreated. There will never be the exact same show twice because it's all volunteer based and what they give me and the energy that, that the audience gives me, I put back. So there, there will never be uh, the same show twice. It just, it can't, it can't happen. Um, and and I, I feel like I'm referencing a friend of mine, uh, Tim Gabrielson, who's another performer, a good buddy of mine. He always talks about how that there's probably someone, you've got a room full of 200 people you're performing for. There's probably someone going through something that is so painful that if we all knew what that person was going through, right, we couldn't even bear, bear it. Um, cause, cause everyone has, is fighting their own challenges, right? Every, everybody has their own issues that they're dealing with. And it's really nice to be able to create a space for people to be able to escape for a bit, to leave those worries behind. It is a clean comedy show. So you can have a family there and, and on bond as a family. I've had countless, countless stories of people come up to me afterwards. And again, I have no idea of, of all this. I'm, I'm just doing my thing. Um, I had a, a elderly woman come up to me after a show and say that um, she was supposed to be here on um, an anniversary trip with her husband of, of many years. Um, the husband passed away and she said she didn't know why she still took the trip, but she said now she knows why because she, want, she came to see my show and it was the first time she had smiled since her husband passed. So she actually said to me, thanks. Thank you for reminding me how to smile. You know, it's like, oof, that's, that's powerful. Uh, when you hear that, I've, I've uh, picked kids who I have no idea of this, but you know, they, they've had terminal ill diseases. I find out afterwards, you know, and I, I, you know, the mom will come up to me crying and saying, Hey, thanks so much. Like it's been a really hard few months or a really hard year. You just, you made his, his day and like all his friends were here, you know, we, and you know, got to see him experience this. I've had Similar with kids who are autistic, who, again, I, I have no idea. I'm just doing my show, pulling up people, having fun, making, making the most of whatever situation happens. And, um, you know, again, I've had parents come up to me and say, like, this was a big breakout moment for, for my son or daughter. I, I, I was not, we never seen something like this, never seen the confidence to come up on stage and to, to, to do something like that. Like, this was so good for my child's confidence and their, their feeling of self-worth. Um, and again, to have the family there to see it and experience. So I think oftentimes, I know your, your show is called The Intended Message, but oftentimes I think it's, it's not even what's intended. It's, it's, it's things that are happening without even knowing it, um, just because you're being true to who you are and you're trying to create a, a, a safe space for people to enjoy and have fun. And uh, all sorts of amazing things can come from that. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you, uh, you teased us earlier by mentioning this phrase. So I'm going to ask you to expand on it. The phrase you said was, what's the craziest thing that happened on stage? So oh, I have to ask. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Well, so the, 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 the nice thing is when you perform for 10 years, six nights a week, I mean, everything you can possibly think of has, has happened. And that is to say that that gives you the confidence then. That's with a lot of that self-talk comes in play to know, hey, you know what, no matter what happens, I can handle it, I can deal with it. So I've had everything happen from I've, I've been injured myself. So I've, I've, I've gotten injuries. The, um, bowling you know, pretty, balls pretty, and knives, I can understand that. <laughs> yeah, shocker, right? Um, you know, I, I don't even know if you can see this. I've got a scar here. Um, 
Oh, it's on this side. There it is. Yeah, there's a scar right there uh, from a ladder that fell, uh, I was balancing a ladder on my chin that slipped off and uh, and fell. So you know, bleeding profusely from my head, middle of the stage or middle of the show. I've had I've had uh, I had a kid wet his pants on stage. Um, you know, in front of everybody and start crying. I've had drunk people come up on stage and then fall off the stage of their own kind of accord, like stumbling on and off. Uh, I mean, power failures, uh, fire alarms that have gone off in the middle. Of, of the show, uh, you know, you, you name it. Um, I've had, I had someone die in my show, actually, uh, believe it or not, a, a corporate show and, and, you know, and had to stop the show, you know, paramedics come in, uh, EMTs, you know, I mean, it's just, it, you know, you're, you're sitting with other people for 75 minutes. So all of those things and more are gonna happen uh, at, at a certain point. I also, I think my show naturally elicits reaction from the audience and response some some shows are more like a sit and watch right like a Cirque du Soleil you know you're not going to get a heckler at Cirque du Soleil right who's going to like interrupt your show my, my show is very spontaneous and based on what the audience and I really encourage the audience to kind of give me stuff to work with so when you do that you kind of open up the door for people to either intentionally or unintentionally mess with your show, mess with your rhythm. Um, if they're kind of starved for attention or they're intoxicated or uh, any, anything else that happens when you're, when you're in Las Vegas, then uh, you, you're really, you're asking for it. But again, I, I prefer to invite that type of spontaneous experience because I want the audience to know this exact same show will never happen again. Like this was special. I was here for something that it was only going to happen once. Jeff, these days you're not headlining um, at the Caesars. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing yep. in, in this whole new world of virtual communication? Yeah. Well, these days uh, no one's headlining in Las Vegas, uh, which is funny because I, I closed my show uh, 2019, the end of 2019. And then, of course, January, February, March hit and all my friends on the strip say, man, what did you know? Did you see this coming or what? And I said, hey, no idea, but uh, I, I joke and say that for a couple months there, I was kind of insecure because all my friends have shows on the Strip, and it's like, oh, I don't have my show anymore. Uh, but now nobody has a show on the Strip anymore, so now uh, we're, all, we're all in the same boat. Um, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing a, a so much virtual work. I'm very grateful. Um, September is actually the busiest month um, and, and financially the, the best month of my career ever, uh, before or after coronavirus, which is, is pretty remarkable, uh, I think, for me personally, since in, in March, all of my engagements for the rest of the year were wiped out. So I'm uh, doing a lot of hosting. That's, that, that, I feel like that's really needed now with these corporate events virtually because everyone's in their own silo. They're all coming from home. And so I feel like now more than ever, you really need a host to pull together all the event elements, to tease out the themes, to connect the dots, a lot of that happens naturally on site when you're physically in the same room. The event gels. It, it, it happens, again, very organically. You might not plan it, but a speaker is going to come out and say, well, you know, I love how so-and-so said this. I'm going to expand on that a little bit more. Or, well, I, I love the way this person put that. Whereas now, virtually, they might be sitting in a waiting room with their camera off, right? And they're just kind of coming in for their piece. Uh, they're not, they're not at the, the bar hearing, you know, in a more informal way about challenges that the company is going through or challenges that the industry has. A lot of those, a lot of those moments, you know, waiting in line at the bathroom, you know, sitting at, at dinner or waiting to get on the bus to the, the social event offsite. That's when a lot of that magic happens. And a lot of that discovery happens. And so without that, again, having an MC who can still create that same kind of energy and still pull all of those event elements together, I think is really important. And fortunately, companies, associations, production companies, bureaus, they have seen that too. They understand that. And they've been keeping me busy with a lot of different events. Jeff, give us, give us an example, uh, one or two examples of, of something you've done in one of these virtual events as an MC that made a difference and it wasn't something you planned. It just, just happened and you were there and you took it and you made it work. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah, sure. Well, you know, I mentioned kind of just acknowledging and being vulnerable and, and authentic. So that's a big part of it in the beginning as people are coming on to the meeting, I like to just be there to kind of have fun with people, right? To spotlight different people and, and say, hey, they might have a, a Vegas Golden Knights, you know, a, a poster in the background. I can say, oh, hey, are you go Knights go? You know, are you, man, what a game last night, you know, or somebody has a, a you know, Dallas Cowboys, you know, thing, a virtual background, say, oh man, tough, tough loss, you know, blah, blah, blah. Be talking with people and then, uh, you know, spotlight other people and let's say somebody's eating a donut, right? And then and all of a sudden, you know, everybody's, you know, say, oh, come on, Frank, put down the donut. We're about to start our meeting. Like, let's get to it, right? Just again, acknowledging that we can see everyone and, and that's okay. And it's, it's going to look and feel a little different than last year. I'll say, hey, make sure you can see me, make sure I can hear you. You know, don't be one of these guys who's like, hey, welcome to the meeting, everybody, right? Like, you know, make sure that we can actually see and hear you. And again, just calling things out like that, I think is, is so important um, and saying, we're not going to try to recreate last year's meeting or our global sales meeting. This year is going to look and feel a little different and that's okay. The point is we're taking the time to come together in this new virtual environment. We're taking the time to connect with each other, to learn, to celebrate our award winners, et cetera. So you kind of have that community type feel where we're still coming together as, as this community um, is just going to look and feel a little different. Now that's maybe a, uh, an appropriate uh, note to, to wrap up on because I, I know there are many people who are sitting through these virtual meetings who, you know, and pick, pick the software, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but people are saying, come there and say, Oh gee, it's a weird world. Everything's strange. But instead of saying how weird and how bad it is maybe that's where they draw upon that self-talk that you as a performer when things are going wrong in a performance how you build on what is good yes absolutely and i love that you brought that up because people like to hate on the virtual events but there are a lot of really amazing things that have come out of virtual events and i i see it every day uh one thing i'll, I'll just note is that people are very forthcoming and honest in the chat much more so than they would be in person at an event. So for example, if I said, hey, at the start of this conference, you know what, tell us in the chat, what's the one challenge that you're dealing with right now? People are gonna tell you, they're gonna say what, what's going on, what's on their mind. If I said that same thing in a ballroom in Dallas and I said, uh, anybody wanna come up on stage in front of 1200 people here and just share some challenges you're going through, pfft, nobody would come up. Same thing about the end of the day. Hey, share an insight that you learned. What did you like most about today's meeting? What speaker resonated with you? What, what message are you going to take forward? Give me an action step. People will write that. And the chat is cataloged, of course. It's recorded and archived. So that's great information for the, the host company uh, to learn or the, or the association what's really going on. So I think that, you know, you, again, you send out a survey monkey with that, you're going to get 10% people respond. But in, in the chat, in the moment like that, uh, people are in state. They're going to they're gonna be very honest with you. So I think that's one same thing. Uh, when you're celebrating awards, you're having an award show in a chat, people are going to say, oh my gosh, Mary is the most incredible human. She did this, this, this. Like, I'm so happy for her. Uh, you're doing a nonprofit fundraiser. This organization, American Heart Association, they, they saved my husband's life. You know, all these wonderful things come out in the chat and a good host can pull out the, the best moments, right? Same thing with speakers. As they're speaking, they can get questions in real time. I do that all the time where I kind of pull something. I can draw and pull out something from the chat. Again, that's a totally different way now that we're communicating. Most, most of the time before it was you speak and then any questions. But now it can be a much more organic dialogue throughout the length of the session. So those are a couple, uh, a couple of good things. I'll say one more here. I love at least for a meeting style, a two-way video like, like this, as opposed to a webinar, which is more of a broadcast. But these two-way meeting styles, I love because you can actually look and see everybody's face. And so you crack a joke, I'm going to smile. Well, guess what? Everybody's going to see all these smiling faces and then they smile. It, it, you know, think about if you're in a ballroom, everyone is facing, Peter, you're, they're all in a silo. So we talk about now in virtual, oh, everyone's in a silo in their own world. True but you're actually able to look and see people's faces and the reactions in real time, whether it's a happy reaction, a, a 
oh, that's a good point, a pensive, you can see what's resonating. Again, in a ballroom, everyone's in their own chair, everyone's looking at the speaker, it's, it's, it's one way. So I love that idea because I've, I can see all these people laughing and see all these people smiling and, and clapping. And again, I'm a big energy guy, that really kind of, uh, that boosts my energy and that makes me feel, uh, feel like uh, alive. And, and I think that's a, an often overlooked element of virtual events that's, that's a, a big plus. For those, uh, for the listeners and viewers, uh, if you're interested to learn more about Jeff uh, and in particular his services providing virtual M seeing for your special events, the way to reach him is at his website. And let's see if I've got it right. It's jeffsevillico.com. Jeff has two it. F's and Sevillico has two L's. You got it. That's My guest today is Jeff Sevillico. He's helping you juggle the priorities and challenges in your life just as he juggles bowling balls and flaming torches. I love it. I love it. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you convey your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.